G'day and welcome back to my channel. Now as you can see, the bounty has moved ahead in leaps and bounds. I've completed this section of planking. I'm just waiting for these, these little toothpick pins here to dry and I can cut them away as I've done already this section here. So following on from last time where I basically showed you in the last few videos what to do to pin, hold and then glue and spike your planks in place. I'm going to go over that a little bit this time but really you should go back and watch those videos if you haven't already because this follows on and I show things like how do we do the tapering well we didn't do any tapering on the stern here we added some wedges yeah we have to add little wedges in because the stern of the planks spreads out it fans out so you have to put wedges in so I'll explain how to do that at the bow there was tapering so I'll explain how I did that tapering how that went in we also have the garboard plank which is the most important one we lay down first which sets sets the tone for everything and how that gets a reverse taper and um, and how it also goes through a 90 degree bend here at um, at the stern it has to bend up to be the angle of the rudder but it starts out flat here on the hull so it has to go through a serious bend so I will show you how I have done all that bending all that clamping all that screwing and all that gluing in this video excited Yes, well I hope so. I found it a lot of fun. I hope you will too. Roll the music. You can see I've already started planking the lower hull and I've got four planks on there. They're already glued in. So I've already been through the stages of basically bending them, pinning them and gluing them, which is the process I showed in previous videos when we were doing the top planks. But just to briefly recap, although I would advise you go back and watch those previous videos because they'll show you in detail, but the planks are put into a tub of water so that they basically soften and they're easy to bend. They're then placed on the model and they're clamped in place to bend to the shape that I need. And then little holes are drilled, every alternate rib and pins are put in, draw pins that I can pull out later. That's then allowed to dry, doesn't take that long. Sometimes overnight, if I need a break, or sometimes later that afternoon, they really don't take long to dry. Uh, you can use a planking bending tool, which is basically like a soldering iron, and um, you can run those over wet planks and dry them. That's a faster method if you like. But because I like to take a break in between stages, my natural workflow is to wet bend the planks, pin as many as I can into place, usually about four or five. Although these birch planks that I'm using here, as opposed to the safety ones, they really work a lot easier. Well, they're easier to work with. They bend a lot easier. They're much more supple. They aren't as well machined. We'll get into that later. But I managed to do actually nine in one, the whole nine. Bend them, wet them, bend them, pin them, where I went. Gluing takes a little longer because it's a bit more labor intensive because I glue and then I pin with toothpicks, what you might call cocktail sticks. And that makes sure that it is a firm fit all the way along the ship's hull. So I've got to plank five. Now I know I've got to plank five because you may see, or I'll add a little picture here, I numbered the planks. Now I did that after I had bent and put them on the frame and they were pinned. I went through and I numbered at the keel here. Well, keel runner. I numbered the planks so that when I pulled them off, I wouldn't get lost and confused because all you do is you end up with a whole lot of planks. You can see, these planks are already bent, they're bent into shape, they've got exactly the curve they need for that particular region. Although they will tighten up, and this is interesting, I found that my nine planks, which were five millimetres each, because I've, I've basically bought new planks, I couldn't buy six millimetre ones, um, well the, basically my shop was out of the safely, so I couldn't buy any more of those. And anyhow my lower hull, as I did on this side, I did in the whiter wood. So I thought, oh well, I'll just get some white planks, and they proved difficult to get in two millimeter thickness uh, at six millimeters wide. Five millimeters was close, and I thought, well, that, that's okay. I'll, I'll try that. This is only the lower layer. I've still got six millimeter planks to match here for the top layer, which are the thin ones. So it's not a problem. This is just the base layer. Anyhow, when I put the um, the wet bent birch planks on, they swell a lot more than the sapy ones did, and I should have had nine fives, right? So I should have had 45 millimeters as my run. Even giving one millimeter um, creepage, as you might expect with with basically, if you haven't uh, if you haven't basically 
put a bevel on the edge there and the planks are clinking together, right? But no, I ended up with two or three millimeters. I think it was about two and a half millimeters extra, which means they had crept that much due to the wood expanding and just the way that they were placed. That's very interesting, which proves my point for my method. Because some people just like to wet them, dry them, glue them, put them on, away you go. But you won't get as tight a fit. And I know this is only the first layer and you're basically going to cover this up anyway. But a good planking method is learnt. And a good way to learn it, because you've got room to make mistakes here, is learn it doing the first layer. Practice your good planking layer here. Because then when you get to the final layer, when you finally get to putting on the, the good planks, and you finally get on putting those very thin ones, you have a method and you have a process that's well established and you have the skill. So, you know, there's, there's little point being slap happy, I feel, with this first layer, even though it'll never be seen. I mean, a rule in carpentry was taught to me very early on from my woodwork teacher, Mr. Beaver. No kidding. At least that's probably the name I remember. Well, he had two big front buck teeth. We called him Mr. Beaver. He probably had a real name. But anyhow, he always said a good carpenter does the work where it's not seen. And what he said he would do if he was buying furniture is he would turn it upside down, have a look at the areas which are not seen, and have a look at the joints underneath and see what the quality was like and how the carpentry was done. If they cared to get that precise, then you knew they had skill and they did a good job. And I think the same thing here. Use the opportunity of your first layer of planks to get the hang of doing your planking. Because if you make a mistake here, it's easy enough to rip it off and replace it, or you can just sand it out and fill. You have got margin for error. So learn and make your mistakes on this layer. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's handy. All right, so with my planks numbered, I can now basically have a look through my pile, and I know number five will be next, and it should fit pretty well perfectly into there. Now, tapering. There wasn't much tapering on these planks, and I'll show you a tapering chart. A lot of confusing numbers. But basically, the tapering worked out that the the stern part, right, towards the after the shift, they didn't require any tapering at all. In fact, they're going to need wedges, and more about that later. And the only tapering I needed was very much on this rib here, which I've called the C-rib. On my thing, I've called the, the tip here of the hull, the bow, right? A, B, C, and so on, all the way through to... Um, I think I wrote them on there. I've got a uh, J and a K. Right? I wrote them on the rib so I'd remember. Now, at my C rib, which is where I'm cutting my planks because I'm going to balsa wood in. If you're not familiar with what I'm doing here, this will be all balsa wood in, exactly as the, um, the stern has been. And the principle and the idea behind this is it's easier with thick planks just to bend a simple curve rather than bending complex curves like I had to do here. So we do the simple curve with the thick planks, bolster in our front and our rear, and then when we lay our thin planks over top, they bend much easier over that bolster. But you've got the structure and the rigidity, which is what you're trying to do with the thick planks, is actually make the thing strong, make the whole frame nice and strong and it holds its shape. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the fixed shape, you get the strength, but your front and your rear is just bolster, bolster blocked into the ribs. Okay. It's a simple method, a bit of a cheats method, a lot of purists don't like it. But anyway, the um, at the bow end here, I only needed to go down to 4mm as, as per my planking chart. So I just created a very simple taper, it was very easy to do. I'll show more of that shortly, but basically I just lined up 4 or 5 of these 2mm planks in the vise, so making sure that they were all level with each other, aligned, and then I'd already marked a pencil line going from 5mm to 4mm, and I ran my plane across it, my wood plane, a tiny little mini plane that I use. All right, so it picks up here. And that gave me that taper, and every one of these planks was tapered before it went into the water. But what I didn't do was bevel them. I've, I've left the beveling till later just to see how the planks fit it. And also I find this, this birch wood needs a bit of cleanup. It's, um, it's a bit rough, which also might have attributed to um, the plank creeping. So my length on the ribs here were 92. So if you've got five planks, five millimeter planks, you're going to need 18 of them. All right, two nines, 18, 
right, it's 90, 92. And then you'll have two millimeters left over. Well, one millimeter creepage for each section because I divide the ship into three sections, okay? So my, my planking is always done the upper part, which is pretty well flat, then the lower first part of the curve, and the bottom last part of the curve. They're my three sections. And they're usually pretty even. Now with six millimeter planks, I think we had eight, eight, and eight. But these are five millimeter planks, so you get a different measurement. So to get this um, point here and then work out the tapering, I needed to know the position here at nine planks, okay? Because it's going to be nine planks and nine planks. So at nine planks, I basically, which was going to be 45 mil, I made a mark. And then I lay this plank down and had a look at where it naturally fell. I did not push it up, I did not pull it down, I just let it sit exactly where it was. And then I marked all of those. And this plank now, even though it has been bent, right, it's been bent on it, okay? If I lay it down on my mat, it's absolutely flat. It does not lift up at either end. The only thing is when I lay it that way, it's up a little bit there, only because of the tapering. So this plank is essentially flat that way. The only bend it has is the curve of the hull. So it is unstressed except for that slight curve of the hull. And that's what I wanted, and that's how I work out my method, is that middle plank must be unstressed, which means there'll be less chance of extreme warpage and pushing my planks way out of shape. I'm following the natural curves of the ship. All right, so with that plank set and my points marked, Right, and I had 45 mil, I know there's 45 mil. I could then measure all the way through. And that's how I ended up with this table. And the table told me for the bottom section here, every one of these stern planks, all right, every one of these planks here in the lower section was at least five mil or greater. So there was no um, tapering need at all. And with my forward planks, they were all fine until we got to this rib. And this rib I needed four millimeters. And this rib I needed five. There's quite a drop. So when you have a look at my planks, they are all tapered just at the end there. Now I make my planks to fit at the stern, they fit up hard, only because I've already put in that bolster, right? Put that bolster in so my plank is going to sit hard up against the, the little groove there. Because my bolster part that I filled is wider, it is two millimeters wider than the frame to allow it to match up to the planks I'm putting in. So that fits hard up against there and it is level. Now at the bow, the plank I cut it slightly over, about a centimetre over, a half an inch over, so that you've got something if you need to pin it and hold it shape, and you've got a little bit to work with. And especially if you're drilling holes to put pins in, or gluing, you're not going to split an end, right? Because here, when I stick the pins in, more than likely I'll split that end, because there's not much there's not much wood there, and that's inevitable. So I try and avoid those splits of punching in my pins or adding my cocktail sticks or my toothpicks to finally lock the planks in place. I avoid that by making sure there's overhang. All right, now what I'd like to show you at this point is we've got plank number five, and again I can find it, six, hang on, it's here somewhere, six, seven, nine, eight, five. Okay, well there's plank five. And plank five should have a bit of a, yeah, it has a curve on it. If I lay plank five down on here, it springs up in the air. It's got a curve that way. So just to show you that they won't all be perfectly flat. Right? They'll all have different curves. Now, plank number five, which... Yep, plank number five. If I match to the holes that I've already drilled, you'll notice, oh dear, it doesn't sit right. It sits up a bit wide here. Okay, and that is because I allowed for a taper. I noticed plank four was starting to strain a little bit when I held it into position. It was sort of pulling down. So when I got to plank five, I let it naturally sit there to see how much out I was. And I found I needed a little wedge. Now I've already put one in. I've already put one tiny little wedge in here. So basically moving a couple more planks along I'd need another wedge and then I found that was the only wedge I needed. After that all the planks sat nicely right up to that middle one which is totally unstressed. It is simply curved to the hull. First I'll need to put in plank five and I will need to bevel those edges and tidy it up because as I said that wood is not the best. Once they're beveled up and I'm quite happy that that's a clean plank I dry fit it, test, make sure it's nice and smooth, it's still fitting fine and then it's on with the glue. 
and I only glue on the ribs and I put that plank in allowing for the wedge letting it just sit naturally well, it was bent there before actually and then I start drilling the holes and putting in my little toothpick spikes work my way along to the hole till I get to the front and spike spike hit hit if you want to know more about that method you'll need to watch the previous videos where I explain in detail how all that was done now I have that plank number five fitted in and glued in place and pinned down with those those wooden toothpicks and it fitted in very nicely because my method of wetting the planks first and push pinning them in to hold them in place and allow them to bend and then to set in that position makes it so much easier when I go to the gluing stage because I'm not fighting the, the plank, it's not pulling against the glue it's sitting there quite happily the one thing I am doing is I'm trying to compress them more to push against each other because now I've beveled them and also now they're dry, they're smaller fractionally, I can tighten this up and already I can see that my holes aren't matching up to what I uh, had pinned before now my tapering chart on the spreadsheet had told me these would be about a 5.2 which of course is bigger than my plank therefore I'm going to need some wedges in there and that's exactly what's happened I need at least two millimeters there I'm going to need a bit more here let's have a look what have we got there's not much more see that was a two yeah I'm still only looking at about I'm still only looking at a two that's pretty consistent so I'm looking at a two there and the lengthwise it's going to have to go from all the way from there to there so I'm looking at about five and a half so I'm going to need a little triangular piece five and a half centimeters long and then just over two millimeters wide there best to make it bigger than you need because it's easier to chisel down than it is to try and add afterwards so that's just a simple matter of finding a bit of waste a little bit of um, planking that I'd cut off I'll just tidy that up a bit it don't take a lot of cutting but these are certainly a bit more work than the um, half millimeter planks which are really easy to make your wedges out of so I need five and a half and then I'm going to need two millimeters here and then I'll just use a toothpick to support my rule because whenever you've got a rule hanging over the edge of a piece of um, timber that you're working on a piece of wood it's good to do that if you don't do that right? You don't do that you put this on here and then as you're trying to cut and everything it'll fall off so there's a little top trip you can use another plank if you happen to have another plank handy I don't so I'm in my studio today not my marina balcony so measuring from there to there going to need two millimeters there that's my wedge that's all I've got to make is that all right so procedure of cutting is the same I will need to support it and I'll simply get my knife now it's never a good idea to cut into the thin end because what will happen is your knife will slide off so what you really need to do is if that's your natural cutting direction is you need to cut away and out from a thin end okay so if I place the rule on there now and this is where I want to come off okay so now if I draw across that way my knife falls off the wood if I was coming this way my knife is going to bounce on the piece of wood and I will not get a nice tapered end so by going this way scoring in gentle scores is it starts to free fairly quickly it's coming apart now Alright, so easy as that. And then going this way, I'll need the same trick. I'll always need to go cutting away from the center and out. Now I have my wedge cut. That's not too bad. So again, this is good practice for making these sort of parts. Do it now. Even though it doesn't have to be perfect for this layer, we are practicing for later on. Now, how does my wedge fit? 
that's not too bad. What we'll do is, I find it's easy to hammer in at the end, and then it'll push down nicely into place. Okay, that fills that gap. It's not too bad. It could have been a bit longer, but that's a feathering little gap. I could probably fill that, but because this is the the first layer, I'm going to let that go. Sometimes I get them better. I got this one much better, but that's not too bad. And anyhow, you're into such a feathering a tight, small piece there. It is really, it's quite difficult. But um, it's jammed nicely in there. It fits there. It fills there. It has done the job. Now there's a bit of glue in there from before, from putting in plank five, but generally what I do with my wedges is I'll actually push the glue in from the top. Works for me. Just basically work it in. You can work it into the curves. You can use a toothpick and you can actually pull that glue into the space. It's not going anywhere anyway, as you see, I've hammered it in. And I had actually troll fit it before I shot the video. I tell you what, it's a bugger to get out. So I know already that it um, it's not going anywhere. And with a little bit of glue in there, that is set in place. This is where the garboard plank has to do its reverse taper. It's the only time we do a taper on the bottom of the plank. And essentially, it's hardly even a taper. It's more of a straight line because the garboard plank's actually curving along there. So what we need to do is we need to know what is that straight line. It's easier to get that line if you look directly down the right angle on the keel. Then you can just pencil it in, feather it in a little bit, make sure it's right, and then it's a simple matter of getting the knife and running the knife against the edge of the keel, you'll get the correct start and end, and the rest of it is, from this angle at least, perfectly straight. So running this way with the knife, making sure that I'm keeping nice and straight and then turning the knife around and running that way. Now you notice I switched angle and I cut it looking directly down along the keel because along the keel it is a straight line. So that if I'm cutting along the keel I'll be cutting a straight line. So there it is. It, it will need sanding again. It's basically going to get sanded. In fact I can trim it off just to show you. One we're going to cut to about there because we're basically going to cut up anyway. I might leave it in to help form with balsa wood. No, I don't really need to. But anyhow, the um, the garboard plank will disappear because of my balsa former that's going to go in there. But again, this is good practice because when you do the garboard plank on the other, on the top layer, which is thinner, and you see my garboard plank here, which was a much wider plank, mentally, it went all the way to there. So this is the thing. Getting your method for, um, in fact, that probably even needs a bit more of a trim, as we can see now. See, looking at this angle, you can see that garboard plank is just a little bit, yeah, it's got a little bit there, needs trimming out. So, having the right angle when you're doing things, which is not always possible on a video because you're working with cameras and iPads and things, but um, yeah, the right angle when you're cutting a plank is going to make all the difference. Because you're always working in composite curves, so it can get very confusing. So, um, there we go. A bit of repairs on camera. There we are. So, yeah, that garbled plank there needed to be perfectly straight. Those final five planks there are now in and they're drying. So, they have been glued and basically spiked with the toothpicks into place. I've started taking off the pins which are. Uh, with the planks that have dried from my previous day's work and had a look at how they're laying and they're not too bad but I must say this birch wood is not as nice to work with as the sapley or even over here this basswood that I use which was lovely to get that effect and I have more of that basswood which I will cover this with I am getting splintering I am getting splitting I'm getting lots of things happening that simply didn't happen with the other woods uh, admittedly, they, they do bend easily, they're nice and soft, so they're easy to sand, but they don't require, they don't have much strength. You can see this thing is quite flexible, whereas here with the Sapley, it's much, much tougher, and yet they're both 2mm planks. So, 
what I'm probably going to do is use a few of my, I've got a couple of leftover safety planks, I'll probably use them in here. And there's also another good reason for that, and this is all about tapering and fitting. As you go, remeasure, because things can change. And I was talking about basically beveling the edges and getting this tighter. Well, I did. I got this two millimetres tighter now that they're dry, but I've actually created a problem for myself. That is now just, it's just over 45 mil, which is terrific. But therefore it hasn't got my excess one mil that I'm going to need to basically allow for creepage. And also here, if I do the same thing, I'm going to end up with a two millimetre gap by the time I get to here. Now, although I've got wriggle room here because there will be a whale line, so there are planks that go over the top of this that will hide it in the finished model. Okay, so over here on this demarcation line, there is actually a big um, ebony plank, I think it is. Or is it African walnut? Probably African walnut. Ebony be too expensive. It's a dark plank, almost a black plank that goes across there. And that if my if my line isn't quite right, well, it's going to hide all the misgivings. So I knew that I could have a tiny gap there and get away with it. I did manage not to have a gap on that side. And I'll probably do a trick here where I might lay two planks of six millimeter using the safely, which is going to eat up that excess. And then if I don't bevel as feverishly, because I don't really need the bevels on the first level, they will all be covered up. I just want to do that in exercise, and I've proved if you bevel them, it tightens up like crazy. Now a number of people ask me, how much beveling do you need? You know, what, what's the angle? Well, there is a simple formula to work it out. Basically, your planks are going to be two millimeters further away from the center of the curve. So in all intents and purposes, this is a quarter of a curve, quarter of a circle, right? So to work out basically how has the circumference changed, you just use pi. Okay, so for a circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. So all right, we're using two millimeter radiuses. That's that's how much more they are. That's our r. Two times pi. Uh, pi is 3.14, so 6.28. Call it 6.3 times two again. 12.6. All right, about 12 and a half mil. So you'll have 12 and a half mil more when you've got two millimeter planks all the way out especially on this radius so how does that affect our beveling well we'll only need a quarter of that well the effect will only be a quarter of that we're doing a quarter of the circle so we're talking basically three millimeters more right for for this quarter circle now this quarter circle assuming this part of our when we split our planking into three sections this part is straight up and down effectively is right this is the only part that's actually the quarter curve so it's half of that again so one and a half call it 1.4 makes math kind of easy so we have 1.4 millimeters we've got seven planks 0.2 of a millimeter per plank is our bevel that is split across each side 0.1 of a millimeter on each side that is a tiny amount it works out at six degrees i think i calculated it so you only need you know that's vertical six degrees so really, to do the beveling is just a, a bit of a, a bit of a run, so that you're beveling into the inside. That's you know, that's about all you do. It's as easy as that. There really isn't a lot, and as I proved here, just a little bit of beveling will tighten up your planks no end. So if it is your top layer and you're only doing, so you don't do two layers with this, with your ship, you're only going to do one layer. Then yes, working out your bevel. And just adding that little bit of a little bit of a bevel, it's only going to be five or six degrees, right? To the, to the planks on the back side is going to mean they join together much tighter, and you won't be able to see daylight through your planks. Well, this video ended up a little bit longer than I thought. I was hoping we'd get in the second half, but we won't. We'll do that next time, and I'll really go through the tapering with you on that because it's going to be a little bit complex. But I'll show you the easy way, and I hope that'll basically take away the fear that. You know, it's not as hard as you think. It's not as difficult. All right, that's it for now. It's goodbye from Australia, and it's Huru from Harry Houdini. Oh, and don't forget, like, comment, subscribe. Just if you're commenting, be nice about it. Huru.